Hello again. Welcome back. It's time for chapter 14, where I get to talk about blood a lot. And yeah, I find it all crazy fascinating. So let's go ahead and get into it so I can tell you all about some of my favorite things about this chapter. The first thing being a Japanese anime. And I know you're like, what does that have to do with this? Now, if you know, then you know. But um, uh, I like anime. I've, I've liked anime for a long time now. I'm a nerd. I mean, I'm a nerd. But um, I haven't watched a lot in the last forever. But um, I did pick up one day. Uh, it was on Netflix. I don't think it's on Netflix anymore. But if you really want, if you like Japanese anime and you really, really, really want a good time learning anatomy and physiology about the immune system and the circulatory system, then my friends, please go check out Cells at Work. It is hysterical. It turns um, pretty much uh, every cell in your immune system and your um, blood system in, into a uh, anime character and um, it's ridiculously over the top, but scientifically accurate. That's the thing that blew my mind. It's absolute. It's like if if your body was a Japanese drama, that's what this anime is. It will not only uh, teach you uh, some really interesting facts about each one of the cells, and it's actually all insanely accurate because I was very impressed. Um, it's also kind of amusing. So, and I think there's a second series out now. There was a first series, and the red blood cell was a female, and she was always getting lost. And this uh, white blood cell had to keep saving her all the time. Um, and then you met the rest of the, the uh, cells as he went along. But anyway, so, yeah. If you ever got some time, <laughs> yeah, when? Uh, check out Cells at Work. It's hysterical, and it's educational. So, win-win. So let's go ahead and talk about blood. So anyway, remember, it's a type of connective tissue. Uh, it carries substances between body cells and the external environment. Uh, blood volume is 8% of body weight. Average adult has 5 liters. So if you find more than 5 liters somewhere, uh, somebody be dead. Um, so formed elements, uh, there's, uh, which is you know the cells themselves, which is the red and white cells, and the platelets. Uh, the plasma is water, amino acids, proteins, carbs, lipids, vitamins, hormones, electrolytes, and cellular wastes, all in one fabulous liquid form. Yeah, which actually we're going to break down and talk about in another chapter in a bit. Um, so, if prevented from clotting and you, like, you know, take a vial of blood and you shove it into a... Um, what is it? Centrifuge, and it spins and spins it really crazy hard. You will always get this. It will always separate into 55%. Uh, the top part is plasma, which is wheat colored. And then you'll have this thin layer, which is less than 1% of white, which is the leukocytes and the platelets, because they don't have a color. And then the bottom, or the heaviest, the erythrocytes, in other words, the uh, red blood cells will be at the bottom, and that's 45% of the total. So, <clears throat> test question, <clears throat> test question. Anyway, now we're going to be coming back to this chart in a minute. Keep in mind, uh, the uh, stem cells that make uh, all of the uh, blood cells are actually uh, really, really able to make all the blood cells. And they can go in any one of different uh, directions in doing this. So basically, we start with a multipotential hemiopoietic stem cell. And it has a choice. It can either split into another stem cell, or it can take one of two tracks. He goes, I want to become more specialized. So he can go into the lymphoid progenitor, which we're going to hint at in this uh, chapter quite a bit. But we're going to talk about it more in the next chapter. Or we can go in the myeloid progenitor path. And the myeloid progenitor path can bring him to one of four ways. In other words, he can swell up into a huge megakaryocyte and then explode into a whole bunch of little platelets, which are also known as thrombocytes. He can go and turn into a reticulocyte, which then gets its, um, uh, gets its uh, nucleus ripped out and it turns into a red blood cell, because red blood cells don't have a nuclei. Uh, it can turn into a mast cell, 
which we'll get into in the next chapter. They come back in later. Um, or it can turn into one of several different white blood cells, uh, which are the myoblast uh, type white blood cells, not to be confused with the lymphoid uh, white blood cells. So yeah, there's two flavors of white blood cells running around in your body. If you didn't think that was confusing, wait for it. Anyway, but I hope not to confuse you. I hope to clear up the confusion, but anyway. So lymphoid white blood cells, myoblast white blood cells. And the myoblast white blood cells we're gonna break down into two groups, basically the granulocytes that you'll see that have all these like little granulousnesses inside. So it looks like they've got crystals on the inside. If you look at them under a microscope, they actually are really pretty. You can pick them out real fast because they, they sparkle when they move. Um, and the non-granulocyte the non ones or the agranulocytes, they don't, they, they don't have any of the sparkle sparkles on the inside. So anyway, but you can usually always pick out which ones these guys are uh, because of their funkily lobed uh, nuclei. So this is their nucleus and they've got these lobes, these weird lobes going on. So you can usually pick out and, and go, oh, that's a neutrophil, oh, that's an acenophil, just by looking at their nucleus. Um, and that's why people work in the lab count doing blood counts, and sometimes you have to do it by eyeball, not by computer. Um, uh, yeah, they're really good at picking out who's who, which is really interesting. Um, we used to have a professor that was working here, Dr. Hayes, and that's literally what he did in the lab. He'd run the, uh, the, the lab for uh, major hospitals. So he was down and they'd call down for all the different lab tests and he'd go up going, no, just give him a pregnancy test. Because uh, <laughs> sometimes some doctors would go for like these expensive labs and it's like, if you read the symptoms, you're like, have you done a cheap, simple lab first? No, I want to do that first. So, fun stories out of him. Anyway, all right, so about the red blood cell. They're also known as erythrocytes. Um, if they're at a Japanese anime called Cells at Work, they look like this. Anyway, they're a biconcave disc shape, and they're one-third hemoglobin with oxyhemoglobin with oxygen and deoxyhemoglobin without oxygen. So they lack a nuclei because it got yoinked out before they were kicked out of the red bone marrow to go uh, do their job. And mitochondria, they cannot divide. Uh, they produce ATP through glycolysis, which happens in the cytoplasm. So that's the way they stay alive. Uh, they don't go through full, you know, making ATP. They just use the glycolysis. Um, their lifespan is around four months to 120 days. So we're constantly recycling these guys. And we're going to talk about how they're recycled in the liver. Um, in the kidneys. So yeah, it breaks down in the liver and the kidneys in a minute. And um, we're constantly recycling their parts, especially the iron, and shipping that back to the red bone marrow to make more of these guys. So that's why we can, you know, re uh, basically make a ton and then, you know, that's why we have blood drives with, you know, the you know, what is it, the Red Cross and the Connections. I think there's the other group that does it around here. Anyway, so that's what these guys do. And it's interesting, um, you might be going, well, if it's always red. Yeah, it's always red in your body. And then you may be going, but, but, but why do I have blue veins? Like if you're pasty pale like me and have zero color because your ancestors came from, decided to be stupid and go live in cold places. Anyway, you might see, especially like on me, I don't know if you can see it right here, but you can see my vein is blue. And you may be going, wait, that looks like my blood is blue. Well, no, your blood is red no matter what. It just gets a little bit redder when it gets oxygen added to it, but it's always red. The reason you see blue is the same reason why the sky is blue. It's because the blue wavelength has more energy behind it and can actually get out of our body. So all the other wavelengths of colors are actually blocked by the several layers of your body, and that's why we see blue veins. The blood that you see in your blue vein is deoxygenated, yes, but it's still red. It's just that the only color that can get out of our body is blue, so that's why we see blue. It's actually the same reason why the sky is blue. There's actually a lot of colors going on up there, but the reason we see blue is because the blue wavelength actually has more energy to it, so therefore it can punch through and we see blue because all the other colors get scattered. Pretty wacky, huh? 
Yay, physics. All right, now, counting red blood cells. So uh, counting red blood cells and white blood cells, um, these are extremely important, especially in diagnosing diseases. Um, that usually, depending on what range they're in, it usually kind of gives you a, you know, ding, something's up. Um, and we're definitely going to talk about that when we talk about the white blood cells in a minute. So, um, these are useful in diagnosis of diseases, evaluating their progress. Um, and you probably as well know, you know, go take a blood sample. Um, same thing with, you know, if you're pregnant, you come in and they suck out most of your blood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to test everything and every anything, and which is a good thing. Um, so yeah, we use our blood for a, a whole bunch of tests. And so, you know, a simple uh, red blood cell count usually can tell you quite a bit, but it also reflects uh, changes in your uh, oxygen carrying capacity. So if somebody's looking a bit blue around the gills, yeah, maybe they're not getting uh, enough oxygen around their body. Uh, so that might be doing, you know, with uh, not enough red blood cells running around or, you know, anemia. We'll get into that in a minute. Now, typical ranges are right here when it comes to the microliters of blood. <coughs> Test question. <coughs> Test question. Anyway, um, moving on. So where do they come from? Where do your red cells, uh, red blood cells come from? I actually mentioned it earlier. They come from your red bone marrow, and their formation is called hematopoiesis. So this is basically where the blood cells originate in your red marrow from uh, hemocytoblasts or hemopoietic stem cells. And the stem cells can then, again, as I was mentioning earlier with the thing, they can choose to make more stem cells for later, or they can go in a more specialized route where they can go into the lymphoid side of things or the myelinoid stem cells. And then from there, lymphoid gives rise to lymphocytes and myelinoid give rise to other things in the formed elements, red blood cells, other types of white blood cells and platelets. And we're gonna talk about what platelets do in a bit as well, because they're very important as well. So erythropoiesis. So basically red blood cell formation occurs in your red bone marrow. If you have low blood oxygen, it causes your kidneys to release EPO, which is a hormone called erythropoietin, which basically tells your red uh, bone marrow to go, oh, uh, we need more oxygen. And it's not the breathing, it's the getting it around. So you better start making a ton more red blood cells. And the red bone marrow goes, got it, boss, and starts going, making a ton more. So it goes from he uh, hemocytoblasts to erythroblasts to reticulocytes, and then it gets its uh, nucleus ripped out by another white blood cell, and then it turns into a erythrocyte, and then released into the blood flow to flow and bring back and then bring oxygen and nutrients all over the body. So do, uh, to make this, we need a lot of B12 and folic acid. So it's interesting. Um, you may be going, but what about iron? But what about it? Because iron, yes, we do need it. It's required for hemoglobin synthesis, but we actually recycle. A lot of times when um, the uh, red blood cells die off, we re recycle a ton of the iron. However, we still need more iron. Everything, you know, deteriorates after time. So this is why, you know, you eat foods high in iron, uh, which is, you know, if you're vegan or vegetarian, I apologize. One of the best places of it, unfortunately, is red meat. And even though I'm trying to cut red meat out of my diet, but mm, steak, I am quite a, you know, carnivore. Anyway, so, however, like if you are a vegetarian or a vegan, hopefully you are taking iron supplements with folic acid and B12 because these, uh, Iron, if you just take straight iron, the only thing it's going to do is make your stools uh, dark. Your body doesn't uptake iron without folic acid. Folic acid is the trigger to let your body know to uptake iron. So, and that's why they tell you when you get pregnant to take, you know, vitamins high in B12 and folic acid because you're basically using that folic acid to build a whole bunch, well, pretty much build a whole new human being. So that's why they, they're really keen on getting folic acid and B12 into you big time. However, you can overdose on these things, which we will discover in another chapter. We're not gonna cover that now. So be careful with iron intake. So always consult a doctor. I know I sound like a commercial for something. You know, you know consult a doctor and not Dr. Monty here, but anyway. 
So, yeah, because this actually iron, if you get too much iron in your system, it can lead to some trouble. So, just FYI. Although, I'm one of the people that I need to get more iron into my system. Anyway, just like I said earlier, uh, small intestine absorbs nutrients. Nutrients are transported to the red blood cells in the bone marrow. Bone marrow circulate, basically gets built there, kicks out, circulates in the bloodstream for 128 days, doing their job. Um, and then macrophages, basically, they, they get pushed through the liver. Remember, the liver is a type of filter. We'll get into him later. And also the kidney. The kidney is also a major filter. It's like the major filter. And he gets his own chapter later because he's so crazy important. And there's a lot of interesting chemistry in there. But it, basically, if they get too old, they get broken down by macrophages. And then we break them up into uh, the globin and the heme, and the heme gets broken up into iron and biliverdin, and then what's left is bilirubin. Now, these two words are going to come back over and over again next chapter and in the digestion chapter. These are pigments. So these are pigments. Biliverdin, if you know anything Spanish, verde means, uh, and I probably butchered saying that, sorry, um, uh, means green, and bilirubin, rubin means red. That's not Spanish, but hey, whatever. Um, but anyway, so, and there's a test question on that. <clears throat> I don't know if it's this one or in the digestive chapter, though. Anyway, so Billy Verdon and iron then get pumped back into the red bone marrow to make more uh, red blood cells. And the Reuben goes into the bile, and that's why, unfortunately, you can have when you, uh, you know, Food goes the opposite way of what it should when your tummy gets upset and you vomit. That's why vomit comes out as green and with some, you know, fun flex because the Billy Verdon and Billy Rubin are involved there. And they actually get, you know, made into bile. And that burning sensation you feel when you vomit is the bile coming back up because bile, bile don't taste good, bile bad. Bile, no, well, bile good when it's in its place. Bile coming back out burns. Yeah. Bile, stay, stay where you need to be. Anyway, we'll get more into that in the digestive system. So just know Billy Verdon is the green pigment, Billy Rubin is the red pigment, because that will probably be a test question later. So, white blood cells, also known as leukocytes, because leuco in Latin means white. So, except they're not white, they're actually colorless. So, eh. anyway, they protect against disease. And uh, white blood cells are produced in the red bone marrow under the control of hormones, uh, which are interleukins and colony stimulating factors, which again, I'm not gonna beat you to death with that. But there are five types of white blood cells in two categories. We've got the granulocytes, as I mentioned earlier, that, that look sparkly because they look like they have a bunch of granules in them. So they look like I have a bunch of crystals. If you look at you know a, a live sample of blood under a microscope, you can see them rolling around in it. Uh, they look like I said they look very sparkly. They're kind of cool. Um, so they have the but they have a very short lifespan. These are the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils. And it's interesting because two of these guys we didn't even know they had a job until we had to uh, see them under certain conditions. Um, the neutrophils are your major component. These are the guys that are always out, always about, always um, killing things if they run into it. So the neutrophils are your main dudes. They're, your, they're like, if you're playing chess, these are your pawns, because there's a ton of them, and we make a ton of them for a reason. They're your frontline dudes. Now, the xenophils are weird, and I'll get into them in a minute, but um, they actually uh, respond to, um, we didn't think they had a job until we saw them respond to uh, parasites. So if you get parasites in the blood and you see a whole bunch of xenophils, that may mean you have uh, parasites in the blood. It's because these guys turn on and trigger for parasites. These guys uh, trigger for uh, allergies, interestingly enough. They will trigger on that one and other things as well. These two have more than one job, but it's weird how these guys trigger. These guys trigger on anything. These guys trigger on certain things. Then you get to the big boys. These are the big ones, and they don't have uh, the granules inside, so they don't look sparkly, but they're big, so you can find them real fast. And that's the A granulocytes, which are the lymphocytes, which are in the lymph, which is the T cells and the B cells. We'll talk about them next chapter. They get their own chapter in the immunity system because that's really important. And then the monocytes. The monocytes are the big boys. I like to liken them to like a, a Pac-Man. Like, nom, 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 nom. Oh. 
because they're always going around eating, 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 eating. If these are the front lines, guys, these are the tanks. <laughs> they come in and they're like, ah, la, la, la. Oh. So, like, for instance, I have a bunch of different plushy viruses here. So I, I use them. Actually, it's going to come into handy when I talk about blood types in a minute. So here's chlamydia, except with a face. They don't have a face, naturally. So, again, what the, uh, I, need a, I need a monocyte. I don't have a monocyte. Hmm. Anyway, but they come across, nom, 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 oh, and they eat them up and uh, walk off. They also do some interesting things where they actually take uh, parts of the uh, virus or the bacteria off and put it on their own outer uh, part for other white blood cells to read. It's actually kind of interesting how that works. We'll get into that next chapter. I love talking about all that stuff. It's really fascinating. So anyway, so again, uh, neutrophils appear light purple. Uh, they have nucleus, which is lobe, two to five parts. They're first to arrive. They attack bacteria, fungi, and some viruses, but make up 54 to 62% of leukocytes in your body. The eosinophils stain red. They're bilobe nuclei. They combat parasitic worm infections, which, like I said, for the longest time, we didn't think that these guys um, did anything until finally we walked, uh, we, we saw somebody with a, you know, parasitic worm infection and all of a sudden these guys were active and killing like crazy. Um, there is an episode dedicated to these guys and these guys um, in uh, Cells at Work. It's actually kind of interesting. Um, they also uh, respond to allergic reactions. So these are the guys that start, like, unfortunately attacking yourself when it comes to allergic reactions. So they're like 1% to 3%. Basophils, similar, uh, more irregular. They release histamine to promote inflammation and heparin that inhibits blood clotting. And we're going to talk about what happens if you get cut and how we heal that up. And unfortunately, our bodies, this is another spot where our body's a bit dumb about it. I'll get there in a minute. But these are the guys, you might be going, oh, it promotes inflammation and then inhibits blood clotting. Isn't that like two opposite ways? Okay, back to where we were. Sorry about that. Somebody had to come in and fix something in my lab, which needs fixing, so yay, fixing in the lab. But boo, kind of interrupting. They didn't know. I should have put a bigger sign on the door. Anyway, for later, for later. Anyway, where was I? Well, these guys right here. Um, so you might be thinking, you know, what's the difference between inflammation and, um, you know, inhibiting blood clotting. Well, that is, if we get too many blood clots, that's a bad thing. So inflammation, what it does, I know it's annoying when you get cut or, you know, get a bruise or something and you get an inflammation there. But it actually, what it's trying to do is push together the part that's been ruptured so it can heal better. Um, that's usually what inflammation does. It's one, pushing the, the, the rip back together, and two, making it super hot in that area to hopefully, with the temperature change, kill off whatever's coming in. So we find it horrible, throbbing, and painful, but it is does have a point. Now, it inhibits blood clotting because after a certain point, we don't want a blood clot to just break off and then go floating about our body because that leads to heart attacks and strokes, and that's not cool. So anyway... Um, over in the A granulocytes, we've got the monocytes, which is the largest of these guys. Like I said, I kind of think of them as a very large Pac-Man-y kind of thing, except not really. Um, and they live for several weeks or months, about 3 to 9%. These guys come and destroy bacteria, dead cells. So, yeah, they even eat dead cells. There's other debris in the tissue. Anything that doesn't belong, and we're going to talk about how they know it doesn't belong or not, um, these guys are the ones that come in and eat it up. So they're like, nom, nom, nom. They're like Cookie Monster, if Cookie Monster was really into bacteria and dead cells and things. Anyway, lymphocytes. These are the smallest of the white blood cells, and we get they get their own chapter in the next chapter, so which is the T cells and the B cells. They do the attacking. They make antibodies and that are special proteins, and we'll get into that in a minute. And they're about 25 to 33%, like I said. They get their own fun time in the next um, in the next thing. So now let's talk about some of the things these guys can do because white blood cells are cool. And you know the movie um, what is it? Osmosis Jones kind of gives light on what they can do. They can change shape and everything. I just hate the live action parts of that movie. Anyway, it was just nasty. The, the animated parts were really good. But anyway, so one of the things uh, that if you remember that movie, he changed the shape of his head at one point, the, the main white blood cell character there. 
anyway, so that's called diapoiesis. Basically, these guys can literally smoosh themselves and change shape, so that way they can smoosh between the cells of a capillary wall and leave the blood vessel and then migrate towards the infection site. Phagocytosis, phago means to eat, cyto means cell. It means engulfing and digesting of pathogens. So if something like, here's COVID-19, you know, they can come up and go, nom, 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 eat it up and destroy it. That's usually what the neutrophils and monocytes, and they're the most mobile and they're most active, and they're mostly chasing things down that don't belong in your body. Again, how do they know that? We're going to get into that in a second. Inflammation response, this is reaction that restricts uh, spread of the inf uh, infection. So again, it's squeezing, 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 but it's also um, uh, to put things together so that way, you know, closing up the rift. But at the same time, um, making it so the blood stays in that one area so that way whatever's in there with it can be trapped and be killed. So, and then positive chemotaxis is the attraction of white blood cells to an infection site by chemicals. Uh, released by the damaged cells. So actually cells do send out an SOS if they've been killed or destroyed uh, without, you know, being, you know, killed like, like apoptosis or apoptosis, you know, program cell death. So, if, you know, a virus comes in and kills the cell, um, then the cell can release a chemical and all the white blood cells are actually really, really sensitive to it and they come running uh, to the site so that actually attracts them. So if like a whole bunch of cells suddenly get ripped apart, it's like a disturbance in you know, the first Star Wars movie. There's a disturbance in the force, except the force is chemicals and your body. And so they go a running to go uh, basically clean up anybody who's you know tried to sneak in or whatever is going on. They come and assist. So yeah, chemicals. Now, white blood cell counts, just like the red blood cell counts, we do this to figure out what you're infected with, usually. It gives you a tip-off. Again, white blood cell count is typically, uh, you know, 3,500 to 10,500 uh, milliliters of blood. <coughs> Test question. Anyway, so leukocytosis, uh, high white blood cell count. Usually this is for acute infections because we're pumping a ton out because we know we're infected with something. Also happens after vigorous exercise and a great loss of body fluids. So you see this like after if somebody gives blood or something or if somebody's losing a whole bunch of blood, which is, you know, not good. And then leukopenia. So this is a low white blood cell count. And this is what you see a lot of times with uh, uh, sicknesses like typhoid fever, flu, measles, mumps, chickenpox, AIDS, polio, anemia. Reason being is because these guys are dying in waves fighting this off, fighting these off. Nor in the case of AIDS, which I'm going to get into next chapter as well, um, it unfortunately kills certain white blood cells. So HIV actually doesn't exactly attack the body in a normal way. It attacks uh, a certain type of white blood cell, only that type of white blood cell, and it disables your immune system, and that can turn into full-blown AIDS. Well, like I said, we're going to talk about more about him and how that works in the next episode next week. So anyway, now percentages may change in particular diseases, uh, diseases, excuse me, neutrophils increase during bacterial infections. So if you see a ton of neutrophils, you can go, mm, bacterial. Or it could be cancer. There are some cancers that make the neutrophils go out of control. Um, so you've got to be careful of that. Also, helper T cells, again, decrease in an HIV infection, which I just touched upon. We'll talk more about that next chapter. Now, thrombocytes or platelets. So these are cytoplasmic fragments of megakaryotypes, so that one that makes groups are big and then all of a sudden explodes into all these fragments. And these guys lack a nucleus. They're less than half the size of a red blood cell. And a platelet count is usually around 150,000 to 350,000 uh, per milliliter of blood. And basically, these helps in hemostasis, which is the stoppage of bleeding and by damaged blood vessels sticking to broken surfaces. These guys are sticky. So what happens if you get a cut or something? Um, it basically makes a bunch of jagged edges inside of your body. And normally veins and arteries and capillaries are very, very smooth. And so they don't hook on anything. Unfortunately, if you've got uh, major cholesterol problems, then yeah, they do. But we'll get there in a minute. That's in a minute. 
So anyway, um, so what happens is they stick onto the broken surfaces, and it's kind of like that one game where you've got all the plastic monkeys and they hook on each other. Think of that, except a bunch of sticky platelets, because they actually hook onto each other and make that first plug. They also release serotonin, which uh, causes smooth muscle and walls and broken bones to contract, again, trapping any diseases or, you know, invaders coming in. Not so much diseases, but like, you know, any invaders from the outside coming in uh, to trap it and also to try and pull those uh, broken walls apart to stop the bleeding as well. So plasma, it's clear straw colored liquid portion of the blood, 55% uh, blood volume, 92% uh, water contains organic and inorganic chemicals. Uh, transports nutrients, gases, hormones, and vitamins. Helps regulate fluid and electrolyte balance in maintaining pH. Uh, we're going to talk more about all of the fun stuff inside of him, especially the electrolyte balance uh, in a later chapter. So just know it's, he's really important for getting things around, like hormones. We just got done talking about hormones, and this is one of the this is the highway of the hormones is your plasma. And that's actually why we have a lot of uh, hormones that are uh, lipid soluble, so they don't dissolve in your plasma. Because it would be bad if you're trying to, you know, your pituitary gland is trying to tell your adrenal cortex that, oh God, zombies are coming, and you know, get into fight or flight mode, and uh, it dissolves halfway there because your plasma is 92 percent water. So that's why hormones are mostly, with the exception of the other types, made of water, so they don't dissolve. Anyway. <clears throat> So, plasma contains a variety of ions called electrolytes since they ionize in water and they can conduct electricity. Why doesn't that mean we have lightning powers? Because we don't generate that much electricity. Bummer. Anyway, so they're absorbed from the intestine or released as byproducts of cellular metabolism. Some of the electrolytes found in blood plasma, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate, sulfate. All of these will come back to you in a later chapter because we're going to talk about them and how they work and the chemistry inside later on down the road. So, yes, I'm introducing them to you now, but I will beat you with them later. And that's a promise. So anyway, sodium and chloride are the most abundant of the electrolytes, which is why uh, Gatorade and um, Powerade are salty drinks. Because when we sweat a lot, we're actually losing a whole bunch of sodium. And for the longest time, uh, we would just let uh, our athletes kind of keel over. That was before World War I. Um, I believe it was before World War I. If you ran a marathon, like in the older Olympics, not the newer Olympics, the today Olympics. Um, the world wars interrupted the Olympics big time. Um, we had, like like I said, the first round of Olympics, which was back before World War I, and then we had the Olympics after World War or technically at the beginning of World War II, and then it resumed after World War II. And those are the more modern Olympics, like what we see on TV today, uh, where we actually, you know, put in rules but um, back before World War I, in the older version of the Olympics, um, yeah, people just, if athletes just dropped dead, that was because they sucked. <laughs> Which is, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So it wasn't until um, later that uh, down in the University of Florida, scientists decided to analyze sweat. And why do people, you know, just drop out of fatigue? Is it something they're losing through sweat? Nobody had ever done it before. So they analyzed all the chemicals and said, hey, we can make a drink out of this and give it to our athletes. So they tested on the football team. And that's where Gatorade came from, because what's the mascot of uh, University of Florida is the Gators. So Gatorade was invented. And Gatorade is actually, yeah, it's, it's good for you. Although the amount of sugar they put into it is not great, because we don't want to drink salt water. That's why we put so much sugar in it. Um, however, other drinks, um, and, and uh, not the energy drinks, but the uh, other athletic drinks like Gatorade and Powerade, the reason they have so much sugar, like I mentioned, is because you don't want to swig salt water. That's not exactly a tasty drink. Um, but things like, uh, what's, the, what's the new one? Prime. Um, that doesn't have the same formulation. That's why they can use less sugar because it doesn't have a lot of sodium in it. And that's something you need to get back, actually, when you're exercising a lot. So Prime is actually, even though it tastes better, apparently, people have told me, 
it's not um, as good for you as Gatorade and Powerade because that's actually scientifically formulated to put back what you're losing in sweat. Um, other brands can't or, and are not up to that same standard. It's kind of interesting. So even though some people go, but Prime tastes so much better. Yeah, I, and it has less sugar. Yeah, it does, but it doesn't have the same things, the same electrolytes you need back in your body. Um, Matt Pat uh, from uh, Game Theory and his Food Theory uh, channel did this. And he goes on and explains that it's actually a really good episode. I should probably slap that episode into my notes when we talk about electrolytes down the road. Anyway, just things to talk about. So what happens when you get cut? You bleed. So anyway, uh, hemostasis is the stoppage of bleeding. So the body has several ways of doing that. You've got the vascular spasm, the platelet plug formation, and blood coagulation. Now, all three of these work together. I try to talk about one, but they all are so interconnected, it's hard to. So I'm gonna start with talking about the vascular spasm, which literally leads into platelet plug uh, formation and then blood coagulation. And then we're gonna talk about what happens when blood clots go rogue, which is never good. So vascular spasm works hand in hand with platelet plug formation and blood coagulation. So if you get cut, this basically stimulates the smooth muscle in the blood to contract to slow the bleeding, which is why we get that inflammation going on. Um, and again, all these cells that just got destroyed send out their chemical signals to warn the white blood cells, oh God, we've been breached. Quick, everybody come, just in case somebody's sneaking in. So, um, they, so they come a-running. And the platelets that float through, like I said, are sticky, and they, they hit, these, um, they hit these, these things, and they stick to each other, and they stick to the, the thing, and they make the first, basically, the first clump to further slow the uh, uh, plug so we're not losing as much blood. And then red blood cells come in, and even they get glued down by uh, fibrin polymers, and that's going to start the uh, uh, blood clot formation. So this is literally the blood clot where literally red blood cells are like, ah, and they get sucked in and then tied down to form the blood clot. So there you go. That's vascular spasm, platelet plug formation, and, you know, the blood clot. Now, blood co uh, coagulation is most uh, effective of the hemostatic reactions forming the blood clot, but it's a huge, huge cascade of chemical reactions. I'm going to show you a map of it in one point. And I don't want you to go, oh, I'm not going to beat you with that. Um, I've got other things to beat you with. But that is not one of them because it is a lot. And unless you're going into this, nobody got time for that. But what I do want you to know is that there is an intrinsic clotting mechanism, which is the tissue factor pathway. This is triggered when a blood vessel contracts due to damaged blood vessel walls. It's a positive feedback mechanism. Ding, 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 ding. Might be a test question. And an intrinsic uh, clotting mechanism. And this is when blood is exposed to a foreign surface. So like you get a splinter or, you know, somebody, I had a student once that liked this, uh, staple themselves so you had to hide all the staple anyway so that would be where the intrinsic clotting mechanism would would come in so here's the pathway as you can see holy cow there is a lot of things so the intrinsic which is when you know the uh, the spasm starts as you can see it's a lot of things going on then you got the intrinsic again uh, activators collagen stuff like that and then they have an overlap, so a nice Venn diagram, and that's called the common pathway. And that brings us to making prothrombin, thrombin, fibrogen, fibrin, and fibrin polymer. And this is that basically where we get scars. So thrombin tells all the fibrogen to come in and start laying down new fibrogen th uh, pol uh, polymers down. Um, unfortunately, our body's a bit dumb. And it starts putting it down in just haphazard ways compared to the actual construction of what your skin is like. So, yeah, any part you have of repaired skin is not as good as the original when you, you know, were forming in your mom and were born. Because our fibrogen, our, uh, yeah, these guys that put it down are kind of like haphazard in doing it, which is why we get scars. Um, because our body's just like, pull it together, pull it together. Should we ne put a nice, nice grid network here? And they're like, nah, we'll just do it haphazardly. And it looks terrible. And it doesn't function like your original skin whatsoever. And you get a scar. 
So another moment of your body is dumb. And you might be going, well, why is it like that? And it's a good question because why is it like that? Because in other mammals, they don't have this. In deer, deer don't get scars. The reason deer don't get scars is because when they get cut or whatever, the fiber and polymer is put down the exact same way when the skin was formed in the first place. So they don't get scars. So why do humans do it? I don't know. If you're interested in such things to learn about in the future, highly recommend you go for that and maybe make scars a thing of the past. So after a blood clot forms, it reacts and pulls the edges together of the uh, broken blood vessel, squeezing the serum out of the clot. Serum is plasma minus the fibrogen. Um, and it's a platelet-derived growth factor that stimulates the smooth muscles and the fibroblasts to repair the damaged vessel walls. Like I said, they put down the fibrin haphazardly and we get scars. Um, plasma digests the fibrin threads and dissolves the blood clot, which is important because after the blood clot is done holding it all together and making sure the blood isn't leaking out, uh, we don't want it leaving because if it does that, it becomes dangerous. And that is a thrombus, which is an abnormal blood clot that forms in a blood vessel. And an embolus is a blood clot moving through the blood vessels, usually ready to get stuck on something. And if it gets stuck, that's where we grow into major problems. So a thrombrosis is a blood clot stuck in a vessel supplying a vital organ, like a brain or your heart, and then you get a stroke or a heart attack, which is never good. An infarction is the death of tissues which have been blocked blood vessels due to a blood uh, clot formation. So like for instance, uh, you know, if something gets damaged on your finger or whatnot and blood clots basically clot it up, your finger can literally atrophy off if we don't get those blood clots out of there, which is actually kind of interesting because we use, sorry Monty, accidentally knocked him in the snout. Um, which is actually interesting was why we use leeches, actually. We put leeches around when we're reattaching fingers and other delicate things because we don't want blood clots forming because that would um, inhibit, you know, the uh, finger growing back together again and reattaching properly. So we actually put, uh, hospitals actually carry uh, live um, um, leeches. So we can put, when we're doing reattachment surgery, we can put leeches around the area because they actually put out blood uh, anticoagulants and actually we don't have to inject it or anything. They just do it to the site so they get fed. They prevent blood clots so your fingers can grow back together. Weird, huh? So yeah, hospitals actually usually have live, um, uh, live, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 those guys. Why did the brain just leave? Anyway, all right. So anyway, an embolism is a blood clot that travels when the uh, and then blocks a blood vessel in an organ, such as pulmonary embolism in lungs. And then there's atherosclerosis, which unfortunately is the accumulation of fat and arterial linings, and sometimes uh, cause an abnormal clot formation, a common form of thrombosis. So what happens is right here. This is a picture of a nice normal artery. See how nice and smooth the walls are and everything should be flowing fine. Well, unfortunately, if you have too much cholesterol, remember cholesterol, we need that in our cell membranes because it stiffens them up so they can keep their shape. However, too much makes them too stiff. And if they're too stiff, then they can't flex. And if they can't flex with, you know, the pumping of the heart and whatnot and sending all the blood through, um, that makes the uh, platelets start catching because it's too stiff, it's not smooth, they start catching, because remember, they're sticky, so they start building up, building up, building up, building up a clot. And remember what I said, that sometimes they'll grab red blood cells and tie them down, and when they do that, you get a blood clot, and then you get a narrowed artery made of plaque, and then that can lead to heart attacks and strokes and all sorts of not so great stuff. So that's why we have to be very careful in, you know, watching your cholesterol levels. Because remember, not all cholesterol is bad cholesterol. There's actually several different levels of cholesterol. So, fun. So, yeah, that can happen. All right, so blood types. This is the last thing I want to talk about real quick. And it can be a little confusing. So, I have to go over a few points and to help explain and why they made a couple of these words very similar to each other. Again, this was nobody consulted me. But yeah, this is where I lose a little bit of people. So if you have questions about this, please post in the forums below and I will help try to explain this as much as possible. So in the 1800s, um, we 
said, you know what? He's got blood, and he's dying because he's had blood loss. What if I take your blood and pump it into him, and he'll live, right? Because blood is blood. And no, oh, that usually killed people. It killed A lot of times it killed, like, uh, quite a few. About 75% of the time it would kill somebody uh, more than it would save somebody. So, interestingly enough, a lot of countries made blood transfusions illegal because it would kill more patients than save, even though blood looks like blood, what's killing them? Well, we finally started figuring out about all these proteins that are sticking out of the cell uh, membrane. And these proteins that stick out, like I'm gonna use um, in my plushy uh, COVID-19 here, cause he's got a ton of them. Um, some do, some don't, like, you know, chlamydia here, he's got some on the top. These are called, these proteins that are sticking out are called antigens. So this is an antigen. Okay, now we produce antibodies which will attach to an antigen and that will make um, these guys get covered in these antibodies and then they can't move and then all of a sudden that macrophage I talked about earlier goes nom 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 nom, eats them. So, however, this happens between uh, bodies all the time. This is actually what the problem is with, um, uh, what is it? This is the major issue with uh, uh, organ donation and organ uh, transplants because we all have antigens on all of our cells. That's how our immune system knows that this cell, you know, this isn't a virus right now, this is a cell, that this cell belongs in your body. Your white blood cells go through and go, oh, you believe, oh, you're, that's us, that's our flag, we live here. So it doesn't attack you. That's how it knows self from not self. Well, unfortunately, if you put in somebody else's blood type and it's not the same blood type, your body comes over and it goes, wait, this isn't us. Kill it, kill it, kill it with fire. So unfortunately, that kills you too. So that's what basically is going on with blood, uh, the different blood groups. So we have four blood groups, A, B, A, B, and O. And O people, I'm an O person, by the way, I have type blood, uh, O type blood. And you may be going, what about positive and negative? Wait for it, wait for it. I don't want to confuse you, so leave that away for right now. Um, o has no flags. That's why O is a universal donor. See down here as well. He has no antigens, so he doesn't have any of these proteins sticking out. Um, and that can be given to anybody because he has no antigens. It doesn't uh, get an immune response. Because so the body comes up, checks it, and goes, you don't have flags, but mm, whatever, you're good. And so it works out. A people have A flags. So these proteins are A proteins that stick out. However, they also come with their immune system has anti-B or antibodies for B type. So if, um, what happens is if B blood gets into an A type person's body, uh, instantly the immune system reacts, makes a ton of anti-Bs and clumps up the blood and then starts attacking the blood and then you die from sh uh, shock. Yeah, not great. Same thing the other way. Uh, B type blood has these B antigens sticking out and their immune system comes with an anti-A already installed, you know, pre-installed software. And unfortunately that also will attach and like clump up. A B people on the other hand have both the A and the B flags, which means, interestingly enough, they have no antibodies, which means they are universal recipients. In other words, AB blood can take blood from anybody, A, B, and O. It can be given to anybody, or he can, he can take from anybody. O can be given to anybody, AB can only take. ABs are actually the more rare out of the four blood types. <clears throat> Test question. Anyway, so, that's what's going on with, uh, you know, your blood types and these antigens sticking out, which are the, these things right here. So this is what your immune system reacts to. Pretty cool, huh? Now, what about the positive or negative? Well, this gives you an extra set of flags or antigens, in other words. If you're positive, you have an extra set of flags. If you're negative, you don't which is why O negative is the blood that the, uh, the Red Cross and all the blood donation places really want because that can be given to anybody, anywhere because it doesn't have any flags, won't trigger nothing. So we call that RH positive or RH negative and it come, the RH comes from the rhesus monkeys in which we discovered this because again, once again, we said, okay, we've got the AB, ABO thing, let's give blood again. And then some people got sick and died. Not a lot, but enough to make us go, oh God, there's something else. 
And um, it's interesting because blood transfusions were illegal up until the 1990s uh, in some places in Europe. And it wasn't until the 1990s that they finally repealed and now because we figured this out. So yeah, blood transfusions actually, yeah, kind of more uh, safer these days than it was even back in the 80s when I was born. Anyway, so again, if you're positive, you have an extra on top of these, having these flags, these antigens, you have an extra sticking out if you're positive. If you're negative, you don't. However, there is a problem with this in pregnancy. In other words, if the child is Rh positive and the mother is Rh negative, the first pregnancy will go fine. Because, but unfortunately, because that child is Rh positive, it stimulates the mother's immune system and she starts building up, building up, building up antibodies to attack the Rh, uh, the Rh positive uh, blood in the baby. So the first pregnancy will go fine. Baby will come to term, everything's shiny. But if the mother gets pregnant again with a second child, uh, all those ant and the second child just happens to be Rh positive too, the antibodies will attack and kill the child in, in vitro. So you've got to be very careful, and this is another reason why we take so many blood tests and we figure out the blood type of mom, the blood type of the baby, because we can figure that out from um, the mom's blood, because it's actually a lot of it's floating around in the mom's blood. Um, so and that's why we have to be very careful about positive or negative blood types, because if you're pregnant and your kid is positive and mom is negative, yeah, the first pregnancy will be fine, but the second pregnancy and any pregnancy after that, if the kid is Rh positive, her immune system will attack and kill it. So they have to be put on um, uh, medication to stop that. So that's something we do uh, blood typing big time real fast with pregnant people um, because of this whole situation. And that is also, I think, on, on the test. All right, with that said, um, highly suggest you watch uh, part one of Blood with Crash Course. And uh, that's a good way to uh, end up with this. And then with that, that covers us for this first week. And I'll see you next week when we get to talk about the immune system and the lymphatic system, which work hand in hand. And it's actually really, really fun to talk about. So I hope you guys have a good one. I'll see you next week. Um, the new videos will post on Wednesdays. Uh, that's usually when I try to post all the videos. Uh, so you've got enough time over the weekend to get everything done, and things are usually due on uh, the Tuesday prior. Um, so, yeah. So with that said, have a good one, and I'll see you next week. Take care.